breaking news, as we thought, Bev. Gary Lineker is back this weekend. The BBC have caved in completely. He'll be back on air after just one weekend off air. The Director General, Tim Davies, says he's a value part of the BBC. We know how much the BBC means to Gary. I look forward to him presenting our coverage this coming weekend. They're fig leaf to cover their embarrassment. They're launching an independent review into social media with a particular emphasis on freelancers like I Gary Lineker. I can tell Lineker. you how much the BBC means to Gary Lineker. It means 1.35 million quid a year. <laughs> That's exactly. what the BBC means to Gary Lineker. I have to say, though, I think it's a triumph for free speech. I know that's a controversial thing to say in this building, but I don't want to live in a world where presenters are... Uh, we, we, here at GB News, we have a, quite a liberal social media yeah. policy to some degree, but we but still not, have to but, but observe. We're not, but we're not funded by the taxpayer to the tune of nearly four billion pounds a year. If you've got a TV, pretty much you have to pay for the licence fee. You used to, if, if you're over 75, you could get it free. A lot of 75 year olds would be very offended by what Gary Lineker said. But if it's if it'd been in some, this is the thing, what I don't, we've got, we've got a guest, we could, we talk about this. Um, right. I think we've got, we've got a guest here. Um, Charlie Beckett is joining us now, Professor of Media and Comms at the London School of Economics. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning to you. Good morning. So we have all this fuss, we have all of this uh, noise, it's all the front page of the papers for days, and then the BBC say he can come back on after missing one Saturday and they're going to look at their social media policy. Is this the right outcome for this? I think it is, actually. I mean, I was predicting this uh, throughout the controversy, actually, but I thought it was extraordinary that the BBC had stumbled into this controversy. And I think the good news uh, for everybody, really, is, as you mentioned, that uh, Lineker is able to say what he feels. Um, and the BBC has learned a valuable lesson, which is don't overreact when, uh, you know, right-wing newspapers and right-wing Tory MPs get cross about something that uh, a freelancer has said. And uh, Andrew is quite right about the fig leaf of this impartiality uh, review or inquiry, uh, but it's also quite necessary because uh, the rules just didn't make sense, or at least the way that Tim Davey had interpreted the rules just didn't make sense that, you know, somehow Gary Lineker was going to be uh, censored. I mean, he's a sports presenter talking about a, a general news issue on his social media, and yet other people have said uh, other controversial things and didn't get uh, mm. silent. It's very important that, you know, people, the BBC journalists, especially their political journalists, are seen to be impartial because that's what's different between them and GB News. GB News, wonderfully, famously, is very partisan. And, you know, as Andrew said, we don't pay a licence fee for GB News, so that's all fair enough. Uh, but the BBC stands out from all the other stuff because it tries, at least, to represent all the views of all the people that pay that licence fee. You mentioned the licence fee, Charlie. We had Jacob Rees-Mogg on just a moment ago saying, in his view, the licence fee has to go. This whole episode confirms why, because if the BBC is nothing, if it isn't about impartiality, do you see the days are numbered for the licence fee, and should they be? No, I think this lesson means the opposite. And I think Andrew quoting Rees Mogg on the BBC is, is hilarious. Um, he's probably the least impartial person I can think <laughs> of when it comes to talking about journalism in general, let alone uh, the BBC. And I think it actually proves the opposite, that however incompetent um, this episode has been, I think it shows that their intentions are good. Uh, that they are trying to be relatively objective in a in a very wicked world where there are lots of partisan people, lots of conspiracy theorists, as Bev mentioned, lots of misinformation out there, uh, and the BBC is at least trying. And if you go anywhere else in the world, you will be hearing people saying how much they wish that they had a kind of boring but balanced broadcaster like the BBC. <laughs> I'm sort of fascinated when we're talking about this issue and how the political left and the political right meld together in this particular conversation. Sure. Because you've got the chair of the BBC, Richard Sharp, who is a Conservative. You've got the director general of the BBC, who literally stood as a Conservative councillor. We've got Gary Lineker accused of being left wing in not supporting Suella Braverman. But we've got the most left wing Conservative government in living memory with the highest tax bill of 70 years. I can't see a true Conservative am amongst a lot of them, Charlie. So is the left right distinction even relevant? Does it help this conversation? 
I think you're spot on. And I think that's one of the problems with this idea of impartiality. The old fashioned idea of impartiality was, look, if I got Andrew on a program, I had to get somebody from the left on the program and then it was all sorted. Um, but I don't think it works like that anymore. Issues, yeah. even an issue like, uh, you know, asylum and refugees, um, doesn't fall neatly into a left right or even a conservative labor mm. or a party political uh, spectrum, does it? You know, uh, it's much more confusing. And therefore, when we talk about impartiality, it's much harder. Impartiality never meant that you had to be uh, balanced or neutral all the time. It just meant that you had to try, at least, to reflect different views. So I'm not bothered that there's a Tory who's uh, the chairperson mm. of the BBC, uh, that, that we've had Labour people yes. being chair of the BBC. But it's, it's how they act. And I think what's compromised it is the particular scandal around Sharp and him not being entirely transparent about his mate Boris and how he helped him get a, a loan. That didn't help. But the fact that they're political doesn't matter. I worked at the BBC for 10 years and I was a member of a party. I'm sure Andrew can guess which party. Yes, I think um, I can. I think you can, Andrew, yeah. But it didn't affect it. In fact, it, it pushed me the other way. I strove all the time to counter my own biases, partly because it's much more interesting, but it also makes for much more uh, interesting journalism, much more reliable journalism. Uh, and I think people at the BBC at least try uh, to do that. Can I ask as well about Gary Lineker? I mean, in a sense, we shouldn't make it about the individual, but he is such a big figure. In a sense yeah. now, this will make him almost untouchable. Well, I don't think so. I think that... Um, uh, I think Gary Ashley, I don't know him personally, but my sense he is a, a thoughtful person. And I think he, he realises that, as Spider-Man would say, with great power comes great responsibility. I mean, Bev mentioned how much he earns there, but he mm. could actually earn a lot more money if he went to commercial channels. Well, so I think he values the BBC and the, 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 the authority that it gives him, actually. You know, and I think he realises he's got to balance that with a little bit more of thoughtfulness about what he says. Well, and how well, he, well he hasn't done he that before, has he? Charlie, there's been, quite a lot, there's been quite a lot of these texts and tweets in the last five or six years, and each time he seems to have been emboldened. I think this might make him emboldened even more. Well, let's see. Um, I, I, I doubt it, to be honest. Um, I think this one particularly... Um, I mean, I don't want to get too much into the sort of Godwin's Law problem around, um, you know, Germany in the 1930s and comparisons with go mm. governments now. I don't think it is particularly a good tactic. Um, but it, what he actually tweeted wasn't entirely wrong. I just think he has to ask himself, was that the best way to mm. uh, express his uh, sympathy uh, with asylum seekers? And it probably wasn't. No. OK, Charlie, thank you. Professor Charlie Beckett there from the London School of Economics. Um, you know, it's interesting, with him, with Gary Lineker being on that £1.35 million BBC salary, he also probably makes that and more from his commercial deals. Yeah. He's very unusual in being a BBC character who is still allowed yeah. and, and to Alice, do and, Al and, and Alistair Campbell, who, of course, was all over the media this weekend, Alice, but Tony Blair's former spin doctor about what an outrage it was, he does a podcast. And whose company produces that podcast? Gary, Gary Lineker. Lineker. He's got a finger in so many pies. And he's also a commentator, I think, on BT Sports. So why the BBC pay him so much money that, is that, beyond me. That is the, the most pertinent question. We've agreed, we both Bev and I know nothing about football. We'll do it for a tenth of the fee. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I'd be terrible. OK, we can also be joined now by former Leeds United Managing Director David Hay, who can uh, give us on the, his thoughts on this from a football side. Uh, good morning, David. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. So... What's your assessment of the situation? Gary Lineker tweets something which some people thought was inappropriate. Others thought he was speaking what they wanted to hear. He has a week of football. He's back on this weekend at the BBC. They're going to look at social media policy. What else do we take from it? I mean, good, good morning, Bevan and Andrew. I mean, firstly, I mean, what, what a mess. I mean, when I looked at the, you, this developing story from a, from a human rights perspective, first of all, you know, I do agree with you know, some of what Andrew, uh, some of what um, uh, Gary Lincoln said. Um, but, you know, what, it, the question that I had was why was it being blown into an issue of human rights, freedom of speech, um, left versus the right, when it really, really, to me, certainly isn't that. When I was at Leeds, we had a very clear social media policy, and that's nearly a 10, 10 years ago now, and that policy 
covered issues of, 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 of people saying, including players saying things on social media that were not appropriate. I remember there was one young young player who was sitting on the bench for a while, wasn't very happy, went onto his Twitter and said, I'm not being played, but at least I'm being paid. And his future, you know, eventually he left the club. So why was that something that was not properly in place, if indeed it wasn't at the time, to prevent this from being blown up? Um, and I think it's very concerning that if that wasn't in place, you saw an avalanche of presenters obviously backing Gary, effectively holding the BBC to hostage. So, I mean, I think, you know, from a football perspective and from, it should have simply been a matter of an employee slash or a contractor performing their obligations in accordance with the contract. And it's now been blown into this. But David, you're absolutely right. I mean, the BBC say they're going to launch an independent review into their social media guidelines. Why did it take this to do that when Gary Lineker has been breaching what Tim Davey clearly thinks is the guidelines for years? I went back, I, we were finding controversies involving Lineker in 2016. This is, as I said at the beginning of the programme, it's just a fig leaf to cover the fact the BBC have marched up the top of the hill and like the grand old Duke of York, they've marched straight back down again. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, why was this not dealt with before? I'm sure there are policies. We've all worked with the BBC. I've worked with the BBC on various programmes like Panorama. We know about the impartiality. Why was this in the first place allowed to happen? Why were other presenters allowed to join him and effectively hold the sports programme into hostage? You know, something that shouldn't, shouldn't, I don't think, happen again. And it's, it's very, very worrying. Um, and it really isn't one about human rights, I don't believe, or free speech. It's, you know, the focus really should be on the football and not, not the pundits. Well, when you say it's not about freedom of speech, how do you draw that conclusion, David? Because what's happened here, he was silenced for saying something that was controversial, and now he's back... This is, this is surely about freedom of speech. It almost doesn't matter, does it, what he said. Like Jacob Rees-Mogg said at the start of the show, we live in a world where we are free to express our opinions, even if people don't like it. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I wouldn't. I, I'm not. I mean, obviously, I'm not there with the internal workings of the BBC, but I'm not sure that he's back there because they're defending the values of freedom of speech. He's back there because, of course, he calls a, 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 a effectively a walkout and a destruction of the sports programming, and they didn't know how mm. to go forward. So, for me, it's not. It, you know, and it's not an issue of free speech. No one's saying to him he can't say what he wants um, elsewhere. I think the problem that you've got with him, as you have with other contractors, is that on his Twitter account, it doesn't say he's an employee of the BBC or not, or a contractor. That little phrase that we all see, for, you know, opinions my own. And I think that's something that BBC really did fail on, because why is it, you know, as, as, as I think some of your presenters said earlier on, he's very much linked with the BBC, rightly yeah. or wrongly in our minds. And and when you see him say something, it's you almost believe yourself that it's a BBC statement, even though it isn't. So that's probably our mistake in thinking that. And, but that, and that's, of course, um, David, why his remarks get such a wide traction, because he is the embodiment of the BBC. He's been there so long. He's part of the fabric and the furniture. Well, absolutely. And I think the other thing, one of you, I think it was Nana at the weekend made, made the comment about the consistency in which the BBC needs to put in place their, their approach to social media activities by their presenters. If they're going to have this approach with one, they need to have the same consistent approach with all the others. Otherwise, that then becomes unfair. You know, we've all seen presenters that have lost their positions in various networks for things they've said in the social media or mm -hmm. on air. Um, and obviously now you've got this issue with Gary Lineker, so I'm sure there'll be some presenter sitting at home somewhat feeling feeling very hard done by. I, I'm amused by the fact on Match of the Day, the Match of the Day audience this weekend, David, was up half a million. Was that just people curious to see how good or bad it was without Lineker, or was that people tuning in thinking, good, we're not going to have all those experts droning on and on? Didn't Michael Gove say once, um, the, the, edu the, the Secretary of State, I'm fed up with experts? Are people fed up with experts? Well, I think I, I was one of the ones that watched it and I hadn't watched it for a very long time. There we are. I probably watched it to see how it would go. I mean, I think, you know, certainly from a football commentary perspective, sometimes there is that little bit too much. So, um, but, well, you, you know, it would have been nice to, to see some younger presenters given that, that opportunity to present that with the support of, of Gary, perhaps, to, to move those on. Obviously, that, that, that didn't happen. But I think, you know, more on the football, less on the, the, the overpaid pundits, I think. Mm. All right, we agree on that. Uh, thank you, David, uh, former United, uh, Leeds Man United Managing Director David Hay. Uh, we've got our national reporter, Ellie Costello, outside Broadcasting House this morning. Hi, Ellie. So we've, we've had this statement from the BBC just moments ago. For people who are tuning in, what did they say? 
Yes, Gary Lineker is set to return to our screens this weekend. It's after a deal has been made with the BBC after what has been a pretty bruising weekend for them, it must be said. So this is a statement uh, from Director General Tim Davey, who said Gary is a valued member of the BBC and I know how much the BBC means to Gary. I look forward to him presenting our coverage this coming weekend. He also announced that the BBC will be launching an independent review into its social media guidelines with a particular focus on freelancers, which is, of course, what Gary Lineker is, uh, outside of news and current affairs. Uh, he continued to say Gary has agreed to abide by this guidance whilst the independent review takes place. Now, Gary Lineker hasn't confirmed this himself. He has actually uh, just been tweeting in the past few, few minutes. He's been tweeting a thread on his personal Twitter page. So I'm just going to share that with you now. Uh, this is from Gary Lineker in the last few minutes. He says, after a surreal few days, I'm delighted that we have navigated our way through this. He goes on to thank the support of BBC Sport. Uh, football is a team game. Their backing was overwhelming. He says he's presented sport on the BBC for the past three decades and he's immeasurably proud to work for the BBC and he can't wait to get back in the chair on Match of the Day on Saturday. But he does continue to stand by his comments that he made last Tuesday. He says, a final thought, however difficult the past few days have been, it simply doesn't compare to having to flee your home from persecution or war to seek refuge in a land far away. It's heartwarming to have seen the empathy towards their plight from so many of you. Remain a country a predominantly tolerant, welcoming and generous people. Thank you. So it does appear as though Gary Lineker is sticking by his comments that he made last Tuesday. Those comments that have snow snowballed uh, into this row over freedom of speech, uh, impartiality uh, at the BBC as well. Uh, but a deal has been made between the BBC and Gary Lineker, and he will be returning to our screens this weekend. Uh, that's Ellie Costello outside the BBC. Bev, he can't help himself, can he? He <laughs> goes, he goes and He's twists the down. knife by saying. Right. I like it. People like me who support that stop the boats policy, which will stop people dying in the channel, stop people fleeing to this country from safe country called France, people coming from Albania. He's again saying that we're wicked racist. That's no, what he's saying. I don't yes, think he, he is. is. Yes, well, he I is. Well, I think I don't he's think he. Do you know what? He's in offensive. all honesty, I don't think he knows what he thinks about well, it. And the bottom line is, his life is not affected by it in any no. way, shape, or form. He lives in a beautiful big house. He can take in his refugees and put them in the back room where the yeah. chef will cook them a dinner. Exactly. But it doesn't really affect his life. I think it's fascinating, though, that he's doubled down on it. He doesn't really know what he's talking about, does he? That's what, that's what I said to the uh, professor earlier. Um, he is now untouchable. He's just proved it, because he'll say to BBC, OK, suspend me again. I've just repeated everything I've said. You know what Outrageous. I like? I like a world in which people have strong opinions. That makes the world a little less vanilla. So I say gloves off. If you work for the BBC, tweet what you like, and we'll talk about it for hours on end.